As you age, your ability to process and tolerate carbohydrates declines. In today's session, what we're going to do is talk more about that process known as age-associated insulin resistance. And then we're going to focus on the ways that you can potentially reverse this age-associated insulin resistance that actually occurs within your skeletal muscle. Now, as we talk about this, I think it's important to recognize that one of the major shortcomings of the low-calorie diet community, people that will say, well, a calorie is a calorie is a calorie. It doesn't really matter what you eat so long as you're in a deficit if you want to lose weight or you're in a surplus if you want to gain weight. The sort of nuance that's omitted from that conversation is the data showing objectively, clearly, through many different populations and ethnicities, that aging is linked with a decline and skeletal muscle insulin sensitivity. And so therefore, we should apply different contexts of diets and apply, you know, help people better understand their carbohydrate tolerance and custom tailor a diet that is commensurate with their age and their activity level. If you're a little bit older and you're not very physically active, the notion of a calorie is a calorie is a calorie. Well, what if you're eating a diet that's rich in carbohydrates and you're not physically active and you know that you're insulin resistant? It makes a little bit more sense to have a lower carbohydrate diet in that particular context. So I think the nuance gets lost in the classic calories in, calories out model, the SECO model. And so that's just something that I think we should focus on, uh, custom tailoring that as we continue this conversation to talk about what happens to the skeletal muscle and why humans naturally become a little bit more insulin resistant as they age. And so I want to share with you some prevalence and statistics with regards to the age-associated changes in insulin sensitivity. I think this is really important. So the, the prevalence of insulin resistance in individuals between the ages of 20 and 39 is only 20%. But this number steeply increases up to 60% in individuals between the ages of 40 and 59 now, there's a big range there between 40 and up to 60%, again, in individuals between the ages of 40 and 60. Now, that number continues to get worse for individuals over the age of 75, where the prevalence is north of 75%. So that means that only one in four individuals over the age of 75 have normal glucose tolerance. Now, you might say, okay, well, why is this happening? And there's a few different mechanisms and that's where I think knowing the mechanisms helps us better understand how to potentially prevent this and also reverse it. Number one, loss of proteostasis. And so what happens is levels of autophagy tend to decline with age. And so there's proteins that accumulate and also fats that, that accumulate within the muscle. And so that leads to uh, changes and, and a reduction in insulin sensitivity. There's also an increase in the smoldering background inflammation. So we want to focus on strategies that reduce inflammation and also increase levels of autophagy, i.e. exercise, eating a lower carb diet, eating less processed foods. Those things come to mind. There's also a reduction in the mitochondrial content within the skeletal muscle. So not only the quantity of mitochondria is reduced, but the overall quality of that mitochondria has been shown to also be reduced, which can be ameliorated by exercise. When you exercise, when you move your muscles, you actually increase the process known as mitophagy, which is the way to break down some of the old sort of not functioning optimally mitochondria, take those raw materials and repurpose them in the form of new mitochondria. So you can start to see here why we're building the argument that staying physically active and eating healthy foods as you age is important. Now, we're also going to talk about high blood pressure and hypertension and loss of muscle, particularly the type two muscle fibers, which are the fast switch muscle fibers. But first friends, I just want to say thank you for being here. Thank you for that like button. Thank you for commenting if you enjoyed this content. And I will also put references below to some of the articles that we're talking about today. And certainly last but not least, today's video is brought to you by Myoscience Nutrition. We're going to talk a lot about being healthy, being fit. One tool that can help you is electrolytes featuring real salt, creatine and taurine. If you're exercising, you want to get more mileage out of that exercise session. So that's why I recommend taking the electrolyte sticks before you work out or actually during your workout to get a little bit extra oomph from that exercise session. You're getting creatine, you're getting taurine, you're getting magnesium, potassium, and real salt, not that fake USB sodium stuff that many other companies unfortunately use. So you can use the coupon code below podcast. That's podcast over at myoscience.com. That's myoscience with an X, M-Y-O-X-E-I-E-N-C-E.com. Okay. So loss of the fast twitch muscle fibers, unfortunately, is a, is a common occurrence that occurs with age. And that is associated with declines in insulin sensitivity and a concomitant increase in inflammation. Okay, so 
Let me share with you these statistics because I think it's really important once you know this, you can change how you exercise. You can focus more on explosive movements instead of just sitting here doing arm curls. So those higher rep exercises are not going to selectively improve the function of the type two fibers that tend to be preferentially lost as you age. So here's some crazy statistics I think you should understand a little bit more about. After the age of 40, individuals experience an 8% loss of muscle, that's total volume, per decade. Okay, so eight per, basically 10% per year roundup. So by the time you're 70, your muscles are about 30% smaller. And most of that loss, again, is occurring because of loss of the type 2, the fast twitch muscle fibers uh, compared to 20 years of age. So you lose a significant amount of size and volume. And what the problem herein is when you lose the type 2 fibers, you lose strength. And this is why strength actually declines, as we've talked about before, at a much faster degree compared to actually the quantity of the muscle. So you lose strength faster, which is why it's so important to train for strength and to focus on strength, to do high-intensity interval training as opposed to always doing long, slow, steady-state cardio. Okay, so the strength loss is about 25 to 40% per decade after the age of 40. And that's much greater, again, compared uh, to the 10% roughly loss of muscle size per decade after the age of 40. So you can see here, this is where the good news is. I know it sounds all bad and scary. You're like, oh my gosh, why even bother with exercise? Because I'm going to lose it anyway. Here's the thing we need to keep in mind. When we're exercising, when we're training, we really slow down and prevent this age-associated loss in both strength and size of the muscles. So you might be thinking, okay, I know exercise is important. I know I need to exercise, again, to improve metabolic health. And this is what it comes down to. It's not just trying to become a bodybuilder just so that you look good at the beach. It's trying to preserve metabolic capacity, blood sugar control, and metabolic health as you age. Because metabolic health is inextricably linked with cardiovascular health. It's linked with the health and the functioning of your brain and also preventing cancer. These, again, are the top three leading causes of premature death and mortality in developed countries, many developed countries. So we want to support metabolic health. Now, of course, you can do this with diet, with eating less processed foods, with feeding window compression and the like, but exercise is a nice way to also improve metabolic health, blood sugar control, and reduce chronic inflammation. So when we, when we want to you know, prescribe exercise, what are the things that we want to think about? We want to think about doing explosive, high-intensity type movements and compound movements. So when I see people at the gym, I... St- and it's great that people are working out, you know, sedentary people are going to the gym and they're doing bicep curls or they're doing sit-ups and these things. Phenomenal. But we want to focus on doing compound movements where you're moving multiple muscles instead of just isolating one particular muscle at a time. And so things like Turkish get-ups, things like hip hinges, deadlifts, things like presses, overhead presses and bench presses. Now, When you think about a compound movement, you're moving more than one joint at a time. When you're squatting, you're moving both your knees, your hips, and then you're also bracing with your core. Now, the challenge with these compound movements is they do require some education. And this is where when you invest in your health and you have a personal trainer or a coach walk you through how to safely do these movements so that it matches your anatomy so that you don't injure yourself. But many people can press at home, bench press, uh, push-ups, you can do handstand push-ups, you can do pull-ups. I mean, these are all things that you can do. You can do air squats. We've talked about and done tutorials on other videos. But when you're doing these compound movements, you're moving multiple muscles at the same time. Now, that's both good and bad for some people because say you do a deadlift or a pull-up, because you're moving so many muscles, not one muscle in particular will always be sore. And some people are like, well, I did all these compound movements, but I'm not totally sore, so I don't know if I'm really moving the muscles. And that's the thing to focus on and sort of mentally get over the fact that you may not be totally sore when you do a pull-up because you're moving your rhomboids, your traps, your biceps, your rear delts, like you're moving a lot of muscles all at once. Don't focus so much on that. Continue, you know, the path and focus on the compound movements because that's where you're going to get most of the mileage. And then you can finish up with these isolation type movements. But we want to focus on strength and speed. And this is something that is not really talked a lot about in the hypertrophy work because you hear slow and you hear about time under tension in this. And while that has its benefit, 
there is a link with time under tension and increased hypertrophy. But always going super slow and always, you know, focusing only on the negatives doesn't necessarily always coincide with improvements in the the strength and the function of the type 2B fibers. So sometimes you want to focus on exploding and focus on that concentric movement because that is how you will help to prevent the preferential loss of the type 2 fibers that is associated with loss of strength as you age because we we know we the epidemiological data loss of strength is linked with uh, an increase in all cause mortality and, and adjusted odds for dying from all causes. So if you can preserve that strength with age by focusing on the high intensity periodically, high intensity interval training, you're focusing on the speed and the strength and not always just going super slow and, and not always considering the time under tension. Yeah, that's important. And that can be periodized and worked into your programming. But one thing that I've learned um, to focus on is strength, is speed. With my trainer, Dan Stephenson, we do a lot with bands and we do a lot with chains and, and working out in, in that regard that can help to train for speed and that can, again, help to uh, improve the type 2 fibers that are associated with explosiveness, with fast twitch uh, capacity. And again, these are the fibers that preferentially become lost and they might be associated with the decline and insulin sensitivity. And so I think that's very important. So in summary, what we need to understand is, is when it comes to nutrition and macros, we need to consider our age. The older we are and the less active we are, the less we should prioritize or focus on carbohydrate quantity in the diet and more probably focus on prioritizing protein and then adjusting the macros based upon our activity level after that. And number two, as we age, we need to always consider resistance training. I've had many people ask me over the years, well, hey, look, Mike, I'm training for a marathon or a 10K and my coach says, do not lift weights because it's going to slow you down. And my response to them is, look, how important is this 10K for you or this? Are you making any money off this? No, it's just for fun. Okay. Well, you want to focus then on your longevity. So you should always continue to lift weights, resistance training, some sort of that, not just myopically focusing on aerobic capacity. We've done other videos on the importance of VO2 max. I'm a fan of that. I think that's important, but a balanced perspective is also improving and preserving strength as you age and focusing on that as well. And so you can do that while continuing, you know, this uh, concomitant training where you're doing both endurance work and weightlifting, right? There's, there's synergies there. There's benefits there. Um, you can check out the podcast that Peter Atia did with Rich Roll and Rich in his 50s, who's having a lot of injuries as a result of only focusing on cardio and sort of endurance work while neglecting strength training. And he's admitting like, gosh, I'm getting weaker and I'm having low back pain. I'm having these injuries because I only did aerobics. I only did endurance training. So I think it's important to, um, to, to do both. And, and that's going to hedge your bets, so to speak, when it comes to longevity and metabolic health. So, and hopefully after watching, one of the takeaways that you got from this is how exercise can improve mitochondrial quantity and the uh, quality of the mitochondria. And that exercise can reduce chronic inflammation. This is something that naturally happens as you age. Exercise also reduces blood pressure. One of the mechanisms associated with increased muscle loss is mediated by blood, the blood pressure regulatory system, the RAS angiotensin uh, system. And so we know that exercise is a phenomenal way to reduce blood pressure. Um, and so there's all these uh, different factors, including but not limited to the improvements in exercise associated increases in autophagy and mitophagy. So it all comes back to the basics. You need to move your body. Resistance training really helps. But again, remember when you're training, try to focus on some of that explosive movements periodically to keep those, those fast twitch fibers functioning properly. And the neuromuscular connection there uh, is important. So as always, friends, hopefully you found this helpful. The links to the articles that we talked about will be below. And I'll be following the comments. So thanks for leaving a comment. Thanks for that like button. We'll catch you on a future one down the road. Bye now.